As some of you may have heard, the molecule phosphine has been detected in the atmosphere of Venus. This is a significant discovery, because as far as we know, phosphine can only be produced by life forms on rocky planets, and it's certainly the case with Earth. So, to find out more about the discovery, the Astrum channel, together with Astrum Espanol and Astrum Brazil, interviewed the co-author of the study, Dr. Clara Sosa Silva, and we put to her some of the highest voted questions about this discovery from you, the subscribers. You know, the first questions from uh, my subscribers, uh, that is from Jose Daniel Miranda. And um, he's asking, like, following your discovery of uh, phosphine in Venus, what are your plans regarding this line of investigation? Um, it's an excellent question. And so the kind of the, there are two big uncertainties in this discovery. One mm -hmm. is, does the signal we detect uh, correspond to phosphine for sure and no other molecule? And the other one is, if it is phosphine, is it life or is it something else? And so for that first part, uh, what we're doing and lots of other teams are doing is analyzing the data and reanalyzing the data and triple analyzing the data and trying to see if we can really say that phosphine is the most plausible candidate. So far, phosphine is the most plausible candidate uh, mm -hmm. for the signal we detected. But then the next step is to try and observe it again and again and again so we can see how it's distributed across Venus. Does it change between day and night? Does it change between seasons? Does it change between different portions of the clouds? Because mm -hmm. if it is created by life, and this is a big, big if, then we expect it to change with time and space like molecules on earth do that are produced mm -hmm. by life and so if it is a biosphere big if then we we can learn how it's behaving and what it's doing based on the distribution of phosphine so that's the next step and then it's mm -hmm. looking for other signs that it's a biosphere if it is life again big if but if it mm -hmm. is life it's not going to be just one species producing one molecule that's completely improbable it's going to be a whole ecosystem you know with their you know dreams wow. and lives and they, they will be producing a lot of strange things and it's kind of our job as scientists as a scientific community to figure it all out okay I, so so yeah can i go just ahead, interject Alex? a question following on from that um which i don't think we're covering the interview questions that we have um what what um instruments specifically will you hope to be utilizing in the future in order to keep a track on phosphine i suppose so the two instruments we've used so far are the JCMT, which is a telescope in Hawaii on a sacred mountain, and ALMA, which is an array of telescopes, a very powerful array. And these are all microwave observations. My personal focus is to look in the infrared, so a different region of the electromagnetic spectrum, using IRTF, which is another telescope on that same sacred mountain. It's a very good mountain for observing. Um, and also using SOFIA, which is a really cool telescope um, mm -hmm. that's on the side of a plane. Oh, yeah. But lots of other people around the world are trying to use their telescopes to see if they can look at Venus. Sadly, I don't think any of these telescopes were designed to look at Venus. And so everyone's just trying to figure out how do we adapt to what we have to look at the nearest star, uh, nearest planet, sorry, because it's so bright. Um, it's so bright that it often it really dazzles the telescopes that we prepared. Um, usually we spend our time trying to get every little photon because there are so few uh, photons from the places we're looking at. And then with Venus, we have this overabundance of photons, which mm -hmm. sometimes saturates the observations. So. Uh, I was going to ask then, would um, the James Webb telescope, would it be helpful now too much? Yes, I'm not an expert on James Webb, but I'm, I'm um, and I don't have the numbers here, but I'm, I think it would saturate, yes. James yeah, Webb okay. is really interesting specifically because it's really useful for looking for faraway planets for which we have, you know, a handful yeah, of yeah, photons. Yeah. So most of my work was looking for phosphine with JWST on these exotic faraway okay. planets that are barely visible. And the whole time next door, um, I could have been, you know, could have had a riches of photons from Venus. So can you explain us um, how your team analyzed the data of ALMA to find PH3? 
So the majority of that work was done by Jane Greaves and Anita Heward, who are all, and the rest of the observation team um, as a big team uh, mm -hmm. that is not just in the UK, but also Japan and the US with myself and others. The, the data is really quite noisy and so it's really hard to clean and, and there's all sorts of really complicated algorithms to try and reduce the data and extract the signal without causing an artificial signal. And mm -hmm. so it's really tough. And even when you get a signal, knowing which molecule is causing it is really difficult. Um, mm -hmm. So there was a, several observations, 18 months apart, to try and make sure that it wasn't a spurious signal and it was real. And we tried many different algorithms, some looking for phosphine and some pretending we weren't looking for phosphine to see if we would still find it. And so there's lots of these techniques to try and avoid bias that one has. Um, and this is, I don't want to speak for the rest of my team. Um, on my side, I was trying to figure out if the shape of the signal could tell us how much phosphine there is, because that's mm -hmm. something that does happen. And if the position of the signal could only correspond to phosphine. And so it's a many step process that needs a lot of okay. people and a lot of expertise. And it took many, many, many months. And mm -hmm. then it went through a review process. So then external experts come and say, this is terrible. Yeah. You need to do this and this and this, mm -hmm. or this is great, but are you sure it's the only way? Try this and this. And so then mm -hmm. we spent a lot more months redoing everything with a different technique to make sure that the signal we got um, was correct. I think sometimes people think we just point our telescopes and go, oh, yeah. phosphine, but how great. <laughs> yeah, there's the phosphine. <laughs> and no, it's really long and difficult and boring. And it takes months and months and months. Um, so it's not, it's not as it used to be with Galileo, where he's like, oh, is there a moon around Jupiter? That's great. <laughs> um, not like that anymore. OK. So how, how long did that take? You know, it was like uh, more than a year, two years? Yeah, more than a year. Um, obviously, we were all doing other projects at the same time, so it's hard to know okay. exactly how long. You know, it wasn't like 10,000 hours, but I don't know um, how long it took. From the original detection on JCMT to the actual publication, it was almost three years. Um, so Three years, wow. Yeah, it's a long time. And from the second analysis to publication was more like eight months. But And even now, we're reanalyzing the data with some new information okay. from the telescope. So it's still ongoing. Então, temos uma pergunta bem interessante de um dos nossos maiores seguidores aqui, que é o Antônio Salas Martinez, que inclusive é um amigo do Rafa também, ele conhece. Então, ele faz a seguinte pergunta. Esse estudo sobre a fosfina também poderia ser aplicado a outros planetas, talvez planetas gasosos ou planetas com características semelhantes a Vênus? E de que maneira a vida poderia existir em algumas camadas da atmosfera de Vênus? É uma ótima pergunta. Portanto, a fosfina é muito difícil de fazer em planetas terrestres, mas não é muito difícil de fazer em situações extremas, como se, uh, se acha em estrelas ou em planetas gasosos, como Júpiter e Saturno. Aliás, até agora, os únicos sítios no sistema solar em que sabíamos da fosfina era a Terra, onde a vida produz, e Júpiter e Saturno, onde não há vida de de certeza, e neste caso a fosfina é produzida porque nas profundidades destes planetas há temperaturas e pressões de hidrogênio tão extremas que a fosfina consegue ser criada espontaneamente. Portanto, nós sabemos da presença da fosfina nestes planetas e nós esperamos achá-la em mais planetas gasosos e estrelas até, em que há acesso a este ambiente extrema, com, com extrema temperatura e hidrogênio e pressão. Mas em planetas terrestres não há nada parecido com estas situações. Todos os planetas terrestres que nós conhecemos e todo o conhecimento que temos sobre planetas terrestres hipotéticos diz-nos que a fosfina não pode ser criada espontaneamente. E por isso é que achá-la na Terra faz sentido, porque aqui há vida a produzi-la, e achar em Vênus não faz sentido, porque nós não sabemos de vida. Mas o que sabemos de Vênus é que, apesar da superfície ser horrível e não dá para vida nenhuma, mesmo vida completamente diferente do que nós conseguimos imaginar, a atmosfera de Vênus não é toda horrível. A maioria é horrível. E mesmo a parte que não é horrível continua a ser horrível para nós. Mas tem temperaturas e pressões agradáveis, é muito mais perto de um, de um dia de verão, desde que não saias daquela camadinha de atmosfera. Não vais muito acima porque é frio demais, não vais muito abaixo porque é quente demais, mas naquela camadinha é habitável, habitável. Não quer dizer que esteja habitada. 
essa camada e, e portanto procurar vida nestas camadas é, é muito interessante porque vai contra a maneira como nós normalmente pensamos em habitabilidade normalmente nós pensamos um planeta é habitável se a superfície for habitável e isso eu não, não tenho problemas, é normal pensarmos assim porque nós somos humanos e nós gostamos de viver na superfície do nosso planeta portanto é um hábito normal mas eu acho que Pensar em Vênus é um bom exercício para começarmos a olhar para a noção de habitabilidade de uma maneira mais, mais global, literalmente e, e, e metaforicamente. E quando olhamos para um planeta distante, que tem uma superfície não habitável, talvez fazemos uma pausa e, e digamos, está bem, a superfície não é habitável, mas o resto, a subsuperfície debaixo da Terra talvez seja habitável, ou a atmosfera, parte da atmosfera, como em Vênus, talvez seja habitável. Portanto, eu espero que esta experiência seja uma lição para todos nós, para tentarmos ser menos terracêntricos, antropocêntricos. Hum, bem interessante. Obrigado, doutora Clara. Não, obrigado por uma ótima pergunta. Imagina, eu vou agradecer depois o Antônio, ele vai ver com certeza, né? O asks, um, in comparison to Earth, Venus hardly has any hydrogen. Life on Earth is made in large part out of hydrogen. If life on Venus predicates on, um, on large amounts of hydrogen, did science somehow miss the existence of large amounts of hydrogen on Venus? How and where could this hydrogen be hiding? I mean, I know that's a lot of assumptions about what this life could be like, but um, it's just based on what we know, I suppose. Yes, and it's an excellent question in, in more ways than I think the obvious ways, which is if there was more hydrogen on Venus, it actually would be easier to make phosphine in some circumstances like a volcano or, or thunder and lightning that can inject energy into a system and maybe temporarily make phosphine able to be created, which currently we don't think it can, partially because there's not enough hydrogen around. Mm -hmm. and, and phosphine, part of the reason it's so hard to make is because phosphorus needs to want to bind with hydrogen hydrogen and you can throw energy at it to make it happen but usually there's just not hydrogen around with nothing better to do usually mm -hmm. hydrogen likes bonding with oxygen to make water yeah. or carbon to make methane mm -hmm. and so it's actually a really important part of our calculations for false positives for life the fact that there's so little hydrogen around venus you know waiting to bond with phosphorus And, and that we know from a variety of reasons, but one of them is because of the other molecules we find on Venus are very much not reduced, they're oxidized. So there's, we know there's not a lot of hydrogen to go around. So that's kind of one part of this question, which is, yes, we know there's very little hydrogen, which is why phosphine is so weird. It's but fine, yes, yeah. It, yeah, but also it makes it hard for us to imagine life like we know it. But it would be rather silly to imagine that life in the universe looks like ours, you know, from the biochemical perspective. Um, let's not presume that if life is inevitable or common, that it should look like us. It would be so strange to think, oh, there's all this huge variety and biodiversity on Earth, which is the same planet, and yet a totally different planet would somehow, you know, trip and have the same biochemistry. So we don't expect life on Venus if there is life on Venus to be anything like ours. And in fact, if it was, it would be a miserable existence. I mean, when I think of these potential Venusians, all my hope for them, all my dreams for them is that they're nothing like us. Because if they are, as you put it, they're going to need hydrogen and oxygen. They're going to need water and they're going yeah. to need to avoid sulfuric acid. And if you want to live your life avoiding sulfuric acid, Venus yeah, is the is last place. place you want to go. <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely a terrible idea. And so I very much expect if there's life on Venus, big if, it does not uh, care for water the way we care for water. It does not care for hydrogen the way we care for hydrogen. And it's probably cool with us as uh, sulfuric acid. It, it thinks we have like a weird thing against it. And uh, they are totally fine with sulfuric acid. So that's my hope for them. And, and that's certainly my expectation. Different life, for sure. That's a really interesting way of looking at it. I haven't considered that before so uh, thanks for that uh, i just You're have one right. more question from uh, one of my other subscribers they say um i'm curious about the alternative methods of phosphine production namely where the production happens if phosphine is not coming from life what layer in the atmosphere could it be made in um i'd imagine the lower layers would be suitable because of the higher pressure and temperature but how would it get into a habitable layer And were you even able to detect which atmospheric layer that the phosphine was in? 
Great question. And your guess is not quite as good as mine, but it's pretty close. <laughs> um, we did a lot of uh, models of the f full atmosphere. So we weren't just trying to understand the layer where we found phosphine. Mm -hmm. We were trying to understand if phosphine could be made anywhere else on the planet and then be transported to where we found it. We do know more or less where we found it because different wavelengths of light, um, when we use them to do observations of Venus, can probe different altitudes. So mm -hmm. for example, in the infrared, it's very very hard to look under the cloud top because the light basically bounces off the top. Then in a microwave, we can look a little deeper. And then we've had probes that were sent to Venus that went all the way down, you know, and melted quite gloriously on the way down, but got some data. And so we know some of the locations of different species. And we can use that to build a, a model of the atmosphere. And so in answer to kind of the, the first thing that, that your questioner said, which is, down at the deep layers, it is slightly easier to make phosphine. Technically, yes, it, in the sense that it's slightly less impossible. Um, but we're still talking <laughs> so hard and so difficult that you cannot make more than trivial amounts that will get destroyed by the time they get yeah. to where we found it. Because although Venus is very famous for being very hot and having a lot of pressure, Phosphine isn't made just because it's hot and there's pressure. It needs a very specific type of pressure, which brings me to your other question, which was hydrogen. It's hydrogen pressure. You can try and put a lot of atmospheric pressure on phosphorus, but unless there's hydrogen around to bond with phosphorus, you cannot get phosphine. And so although Venus seems to be like a good place to make phosphine because it's so hot and so high pressure, there's just not enough hydrogen. So you would have to kind of free it from something else first, which is why we looked at things like volcanoes and tectonic plates and thunder. And yes, you could make tiny amounts deep in the surface, um, but never anything like we found. And by the time it makes it up, it would have been destroyed. So this is something we analyze. But I should point out with very little data, we still know so little about Venus. We know so little about the pressure and temperature profile, how it changes with altitude. We know so little about the hazes and dust that you find in the atmosphere. We know so little about the different compositions of, of different layers of the atmosphere. So it's possible that there's something really exotic, really strange that we haven't even been able to conceive of that could be making phosphine, but we have tried really hard. We have a hundred page plus document basically dedicated to the saga of thinking of all the things that it couldn't be. Um, yeah. and, and people that's freely available online. People are welcome to check it out. It's where I direct people every time they say, what about if we did this? Could we make phosphine? And I say, that's on page 56. Check it out. <laughs> Uh, just to say, I forgot to mention it was uh, from Matthew Malaka, that question. I love that. Hi, Matthew. Great question. <laughs> one, one of my subscribers, uh, Mr. Escape 7777, <laughs> many sevens. <laughs> and he asked if uh, cool phosphine plus the, da the dark spots detected on Venus clouds mean that something is metabolizing sunlight and could this hypothetical life had evolved from the surface of Venus when it was more habitable. Wow, that is speculative, Mr. Yes. Escape 7777. <laughs> um, <laughs> So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, yes, there is a, a mysterious UV absorber in the atmosphere. Um, mm -hmm. There's no reason to think it's related to phosphine other than okay. if, big if, there is life in the clouds, it is likely that is a complex ecosystem that is doing a lot of things and could easily be doing these two strange things, you know, phosphine and mm -hmm. the UV absorber. We expect it to have a huge impact in its atmosphere, the same way life on Earth has a huge impact in the atmosphere. We basically terraformed our own planet. And so we would expect any life on Venus to be interacting with its atmosphere. Um, could it have evolved from the surface? Absolutely. Venus used to be mm -hmm. habitable. That doesn't mean it was inhabited, but used to be habitable on the surface, the way we usually think about habitable planets. You know, lovely temperatures, enough protection from the sunlight, but not too much pressure. Um, but yes, a runaway greenhouse effect rendered the, the surface completely uninhabitable. And so... I don't like to think about this too much because it's too tragic, mm -hmm. but yes, if there was life on the surface, then they witness not just a mass extinction event, but they saw everyone die, everything 
die. Mm -hmm. And any life that was able to just through enormous struggle adapt to the ever shrinking layer of the atmosphere that remains habitable may have done so. And in which case they're now witnessing this layer get ever, ever smaller and watching mass extinctions happen every day and watching as less and less of them can survive, um, fighting for fewer molecules of water and met metabolizing with the sunlight. Sure. But that's the last thing they have. And so, it's really tragic and i i hope sure. that's not what happened i hope okay. this life was waiting for a hot and sulfuric acid heavy and super dry um habitat to finally be happy and um, so that's what i hope for them but i don't know okay all right so following a little bit this question um this is another question by uh, romaxu kithova and roberto aleman it's actually they make kind of the same question um, so is it possible that this hypothetical life on Venus and even Mars had been shared with Earth through uh, panspermia? Yeah, so panspermia, for those who don't know, is the idea that life can move between planets. And it's often invoked to say that maybe life didn't originate on Earth. Maybe it hitched a ride on um, a body that swooped in like a comet and then kind of seeded life on Earth. And that's, of course, very interesting and very cool as a concept, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really fix the problem that we still have to explain how life originated wherever it came from. And so we call this a displaced improbability, where when you can't explain mm -hmm. something, you just move it somewhere else. And then there's another place where you can't explain it. Now, on Venus, um, it is technically possible to hitch a ride to um, Venus, and we did send probes there. I would like to point out that the probes we sent were made of lead and they melted. So the idea mm -hmm. that any poor living thing uh, that hitched a ride would have somehow survived while lead was melting is rather improbable. And I would like to point out also that even on Earth, the extrema files that we have, and these are very competent life forms that can withstand extreme dry circumstances and extreme acidities and extreme heat, and we should all be very proud of their skills, they wouldn't last a second on the Venusian clouds. The things on Earth that really can handle a lot of acidity, that's in kind of Earth terms. The Venusian mm -hmm. clouds are not just acidic. It's basically a tiny bit of water diluted in acid, which is kind of the opposite way we think. So the acidity is literally off the scale, the pH scale that we use. It's out of that scale. So our extremophiles, as competent as they are, would not have lasted very long. So this is one of these situations, the panspermia explanation, that is possible, but improbable mm -hmm. and implausible. So um, what do you think will be the implications of finally finding life outside of Earth? Um, how do you think it will change our perception of the universe and our planet? I mean, that's more a question for a poet or a philosopher. <laughs> um, uh, I, th I think you got this. <laughs> But I, you know, I'm hoping you'll make us a little less selfish. Um, mm -hmm. I think we like to think that we're special. Um, mm -hmm. And that just seems to me like a mathematical improbability. You know, the sun isn't special. The molecular cloud that formed that solar system is not special. Uh, mm -hmm. Rocky planets are not special. They're the most common type of planets in the universe. Our galaxy has 300 billion stars. Um, and the sun is just average. It's a mediocre star. Um, and our solar system is a mediocre solar system and our, a rocky planet is a mediocre planet. And so to then think after all this wonderful, you know, averageness that somehow we are exceptional um, is a total, totally human instinct. We love believing in the exceptionality of the human condition. And I appreciate that. Some of the best books I've read rely on that. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> some of the greatest art that was produced relies on that. And so I, I don't want it gone, but I think it would be nice to all of us be okay with not being quite that special. And it's funny if, how in, in space there is that, I don't know, concept of us being special because even back hundreds of years ago, we had that um, geocentric model, you know, the whole universe revolved around us. us 
quite a selfish way of thinking about it, I suppose. But uh, that it's was like our the, concept the, at one point. It's the ultimate selfishness, you know, that the universe yeah. literally orbits us. Yeah. And then some very clever people were like, no, 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 you got it wrong. The universe revolves around the sun. And it's like, better, <laughs> um, but still, still wrong, <laughs> still completely wrong. And yeah, and I think, you know, we've been walking towards coming to terms with not just not being alone, but not being special. And I think people find it easier to imagine we're not alone than they find to imagine that they're not special. And that is okay. I much prefer it if the universe is filled with life. And that means we have buddies all over and enemies maybe, but we have, you know, that there's life all over. I much rather have company than to be special. And so that's what I'm hoping people will come to. Thanks for watching. As the world turns towards Venus, we now have some exciting moments ahead. Want to keep up with this discovery? Subscribe for any future updates and for more space videos. A big thank you again to Rafa and Dennis from the Spanish and Portuguese channels. If you speak either of those languages, be sure to check them out. Find their links in the description. All the best and see you next time.